Thank you very much, Philip. Can you hear me at the back? I'm assuming that you can. Yes? Is that better? Good. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. In fact, it's quite thrilling. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Abu Dhabi has obviously become a huge part of my mental universe in the past year or so. Just two years, as I was saying to Philip, since he and I were sitting in a coffee shop in New York talking about what our dream curriculum might be and so on. And one or the other was said, what about the Silk Roads? So from there to here, it's been quite a long road. It's really exciting to be able to visit and to experience it firsthand and to put some reality behind my assumption that, in a nutshell, things, including the Silk Roads, might look different from here. And speaking of assumptions, I always start with students wherever and almost whatever I'm teaching by asking them what are their assumptions and what are their stereotypes and let's examine those and let's, if necessary, try to dispel them. And with the Silk Roads, that isn't in some ways all that difficult because mostly they don't know what it is. They don't know where it might be, but it sounds exotic. It's always a popular course, probably for that reason. Even so, they do have a number of assumptions. And to take just a few, among the many that I hope to get students at least to question, are uh, first of all, those that, have with idea that, that, those that have to do with the idea about globalization is something new, just the other day. The newness of diasporas and the newness of multiculturalism outside a US context. And the related, and to me, self-evidently mistaken idea that nations and cultures have ever existed in isolation from one another and that they are or can somehow be pure and untouched and unaffected by outside influences. Closely related to that is the idea, still widely taught in American high schools, that until the West came along in the 19th century, China was isolated and insular, backward and anti-foreign, a notion that the mere fact of the Silk Roads should put to rest for once and for all. The second stereotype is the idea that a road, in this case the Silk Road, is a single road that goes in a straight line from one place to another, and that things and people and ideas tend to move only in linear fashion and in one direction along that imaginary path. To the contrary, I would argue, particularly from the vantage point of Abu Dhabi, as the new global crossroads of ideas, amongst other things, that the Silk Roads are better thought of as a series of crossroads. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And finally, because so much of the tangible history of the Silk Roads is about art in the form of murals, architecture, sculpture, and other objects, much of which can be seen now in museums in the West, in London, in Paris, in Berlin, in New York, and so on. I hope to get students to think more generally about cosmopolitanism now and in the past in the context of the perennial issue of who owns art, and to consider at the same time the question of influence. In other words, because ideas and design styles or sets of practices look rather the same, can we assume that one influenced the other? And in that case, which came first? Or should we be thinking about things arising independently in parallel with one another? And to some extent, the question here is, does that matter? And if so, why does it matter? I think it does matter very much, but um, this is something that I try to get students to think about. So today, I want to begin by talking about idea and reality in relation to the Silk Road. It's such a, the Silk Road's the Silk Road, whether you talk about them in the singular or the plural, it's such a vague and imprecise catch-all term. What is it, and what was it, and what do people think it is or was? So after that, I want to talk about one particular crossroads area. In other words, Afghanistan as a crossroads of Central Asia, as a case study of the very early interactions as attested by art recovered from the Kabul Museum, where it was hidden away by the curators. Um, I, um, I'm sorry, I've got a, a problem seeing what I'm trying to say. Um, and the reason I picked Afghanistan is not only because it's a central crossroads of the 
Silk Roads, but also because just recently there was an absolutely spectacular exhibition in New York City, some parts of some of the exhibits from which I'm going to show you images from. And finally, I want to talk about teaching the Silk Roads, um, the different ways in which I've done this over the last decade or so in New York, both in terms of subject matter and in terms of chronology, with, of course, a focus on China looking at different perspectives and at some of the goods and ideas and people who traveled back and forth between the ends of Asia from antiquity down to the 20th century, really. So let me begin with what we mean by the Silk Roads. And that also goes to the question of the time period that we're referring to. And let me say that at once that we have no idea when these interactions began. The connections across Asia really began back in the mists of time. The term the Silk Roads, however, was coined only in the late 19th century by a German explorer and geographer. And it's such an evocative name. And for Westerners, at least, it conjures up images of this kind, visions of camels laden with bales of luxurious textiles and other goods, trudging across deserts through oasis towns along mountain passes, linking east and west. And of course, the first thing that occurs to me as I'm thinking about teaching this course in Abu Dhabi is that for people for whom the desert is a fact of life rather than a romantic imagining, those images may not be quite so evocative. And here is another early photograph of a camel caravan from the early 1900s. At any rate, in general, we can say that the Silk Roads were a series of trade routes that linked Western and Eastern Asia, both by land and by sea. I think usually people think that we're only talking about the land route, and especially for the Gulf region, the sea route was extremely important. Sometimes those connections were partly by land and partly by sea, stretching from China and Japan in the east to the Mediterranean world of North Africa, the Middle East, Southern Europe, and points beyond. I was told I wouldn't be able to um, point to things, but I think you can pretty much see on the map what I'm talking about. And as I said, the origins of these east-west connections are lost in the mists of time, but the earliest recorded history dates approximately from the 2nd to 1st century BCE, when the Eurasian continent was anchored at one end by the Han Empire in China and at the other end by the Roman Empire. Each of these empires organized vast territories into orderly, coherent polities, which enabled their subjects and other people to carry on trade and to seek prosperity under conditions of relative prosperity. In other words, it was safe for trading networks to link either end of the landmass. Not, however, that for the most part, the two ends interacted directly. In fact, before the 13th century Mongol era, the first time that a single polity controlled the entire route from one end to the other of the landmass, so that Marco Polo, who did go all the way from Venice to China, or we think that he went all the way from Venice to China, was actually quite unusual. But the commonest form of Silk Road trade was, in fact, through middlemen. That is, there was a kind of relay system. So what we should think of the Silk Roads as was a is in terms of chains with a series of links. And even then, it would take several months to make the round-trip journey, or the series of round-trip journeys, as it were. And Silk Road caravans might travel 20 miles a day. When you look at this huge map, you can see why it would take such a long time. They would leave early in the morning so as to avoid the midday heat. And the reason people didn't go the whole way was essentially that you needed to know what you were doing. You needed to know the best way to go. You needed to know the people who could help you, what the market was like, what the tariffs were, what, in case you might need it, was the camel rental situation, all those kinds of questions. And in those far off days, you could never know also if it, it's very hard for us in this era of Skype and cell phones to remember this, I think, especially for young people. But you never knew when you showed up in an oasis, if another caravan carrying other goods that were essentially not that different from what you had might not have showed up the day before so that demand and prices would be, have dropped. So the potential for profit was huge, but you could easily lose everything. There wasn't much transparency, in other words, with these overland routes. And it's generally said, going back to the question of chronology, 
that the overland routes died out after the age of sea travel began around the time of the European voyages of discovery in the 14th and 15th centuries. And that the main reason it died out was that it mu was much cheaper to send goods by sea. And that with the decline of the Chinese monopoly on silk and the rise of the international passion for Chinese ceramics also, the Chinese monopoly on silk actually came to an end in about the 6th century when some monks smuggled silkworm cocoons out of China in their pockets. Um, but the Chinese monopoly on porcelain, true, fine, thin porcelain, lasted until the 18th century. But anyway, it's generally said that sea travel was just more practical because it was e if you carried ceramics on the backs of camels, they would break, essentially. Um, and that, in fact, is one of those... That part of it may be true, but overall, the, the assumption, though commonplace, is mistaken. First of all, it's not with the age of European voyages of discovery that sea travel begins. Um, Arab shipping and Indian shipping and Chinese shipping had already been plying the seas between the Middle East and China by way of South and Southeast Asia for centuries by that time. So maritime trade was nothing new, to say the least. And second, the issue was not so much cost as transparency. In other words, it didn't cost that much less to travel by sea than over land. Um, one out of ten ships went down, and there was also, as there still is, quite a risk of piracy. Although to some extent you could get round that by having armed guards on board your ships. But it was possible to have more control over the situation by sea. And from there you got the European quest to literally sink the competition and control the seas. So that in the coffee houses of London there could be certainty that long distance trade was under control and that, in fact that ships would get there. So in short, sea travel was just more reliable and more transparent than the overland routes. Um, but the overland routes didn't, in fact, completely die out. All that said, let's turn our minds back in time to the early overland routes in order to suggest a few frameworks in which to think about the Silk Roads as they actually were. And the first is in terms of the interactions of civilizations. And although Han China and ancient Rome were not directly in contact with one another, they knew about one another. The Chinese referred to the Roman Empire as Da Qin, which probably refers to the eastern end of the Roman Empire in Syria, rather than Rome itself. And the Romans equally were aware of and strongly desired good silk, which they first encountered at the Battle of Carrhae in 53 BCE, a famous defeat for the Romans in which the Romans were both intimidated and awestruck by the sight of the Parthians waving terrifying silken banners, Chinese silk in other words. And the Romans also wanted spices from the east, while the Chinese desired in particular Roman gold, silver and glass. Alternatively, we might think about the Silk Roads in terms of a trans-ecological connection. And here you have to imagine two worlds, one settled and agrarian with people growing crops, and the other pastoralist and nomadic. Exchanges took place both within these, um, in other words, agrarian to agrarian and pastoralist to pastoralist, and between one another, agrarian to pastoralist, and vice versa. And these exchanges were very old and were, in effect, a single network of exchange creating a larger unity. So in addition to the settled agrarian empires, the, the Chinese and Roman ones, in particular, you had many nomadic empires, such as, in particular, the Xiongnu on China's front frontiers, sometimes said to be the um, ancestors of, of the Huns and others. So taking these Xiongnu as our example, we can say that the nomad, nomadic empires were important for two reason, reasons. The first reason was that they wanted Chinese goods, which they obtained by raiding into Chinese territory. And since China often wasn't strong enough to stop them militarily, it devised various other ways of dealing with them, such as buying them off with gifts, as they were referred to, of goods, and at the same time sending emissaries to form alliances with groups who were based beyond the Xiongnu, far to the west of China. And those emissaries and generals eventually brought back tales of foreign lands and of luxury goods, and we have stories of Han generals bringing back wonderful rugs from their campaigns in what's now Xinjiang province. 
So the desire to acquire luxury goods began in those kinds of ways, I think. And second, of course, since the nomads were by definition highly mobile, they themselves constituted an important part of the chain of links that created the Silk Roads. So this um, interaction concept is key. But a third way that we might think about the Silk Roads is in terms of diasporas. And once cities developed, trade settlements began, and commercial specialists would remove themselves physically from home and go to live elsewhere, usually not in a fringe town, but in a community that was important in the life of the host community. There, foreign merchants could settle down. They could learn the language and customs and the commercial practices of their hosts, and they could serve as cross-cultural brokers, helping and encouraging trade between the host society and people of their own origin who would move back and forth along the trade routes. And there was therefore a distinction between merchants who moved and settled and those who continued to go back and forth. What might have begun as a single settlement became more complex. The merchants who might have begun with single settlements abroad tended to set up a whole series of trade settlements in alien towns. So the result was an interrelated net of commercial communities, a trade network or diaspora, in other words. But the interesting thing about these was that in the long run, these trade diasporas put themselves out of business through their own success, as it were. They began because cultural differences created a need for mediation. But over time, the very success of that mediation reduced the differences and hence the need for the brokers. And where at first trade over long distances required a kinsman or a trusted fellow countryman to act as an agent, over time other agents came to be available. And there were also other ways in which they worked themselves out of business. For example, some people simply went home and left locals to carry on in their stead, while others left um, cultural minorities in foreign lands, even though those minorities no longer devoted themselves to long-distance trade. And that raises a very important issue, which is one of assimilation, which I will return to. I would like to talk, but I'm not going to today. There are, lots, there are so many topics that one could talk about talking about the Silk Roads. And I said to somebody, well, I could just talk about food on the Silk Road, but I'm not going to do that. Another is the question of gender and the Silk Roads, which is particularly interesting when you think of all these men traveling, leaving women for months at a time on their own to run the family and support people and so on. But those are topics that are beyond my scope today. So the last thing we might think about the Silk Roads as is as a metaphor, as it's so often used nowadays. I think, in fact, today the term is more often used as a general metaphor for East-West relations than anything else. And it really does crop up everywhere. And I have a few examples here. US congressmen, for example, refer to needing a Silk Road strategy in Central Asia and the Transcaucasus aimed at upholding the, quote, spirit of the Great Silk Road. Western journalists talk about a drug trade that follows the ancient Silk Road in places as far apart as Ukraine and Afghanistan. Yo-Yo Ma's Silk Road project um, unites musicians from across Central Asia. North and South Korea have at one time tentatively celebrated the development of an iron Silk Road, a rail link in other words. Um, as the Central Asian Republic signed onto the web, the, um, the United Nations anticipated a virtual Silk Road. And now we have Symphendorfer's book, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, The New Silk Road Between the Arab World and China. Just came out, I think, this year. And this kind of rhetoric is great for the language of diplomacy and cooperation, but it can mean different things to different people. In the West, I think it carries a whiff of romance, but among other things, it also sometimes is infused with a certain set of implications that compare the progressive, dynamic West with the backward, possibly purer, but static East, pretty much undefined. And as such, it refers to the time of empires and of imperialism. Yet at the same time, the idea of the Silk Road has a certain appeal for people located on the Silk Road in the sense that it harks back to a time when the East was central and wealthy. And these are the East, the West, very vague ideas. But this time when the East was central and wealthy and the West was more peripheral. And that brings me to the idea of crossroads. The many routes of the Silk Road, of course, involve many interacting and interrelated crossroads. 
both in terms of goods and ideas that intersect and take new turns, and in terms of locations, as I mentioned earlier, not just ends but meeting points. And for one among many examples, let's look at Afghanistan. The course that I'm currently teaching in New York, not this week, but normally, on the Silk Roads, I'm co-teaching with an art historian, Jiahui Jenny Liu, and it began with a visit to a wonderful exhibition of hidden treasures from the National Museum in Kabul, which focused on three major sites. Iconum, sometimes called Alexandria on the Oxus, a city established by one of Alexander the Great's former commanders that was, uh, who was left behind after his conquest of the Persian Empire and pushed to the borders of India. The second one, Begram, a great trading center, and the third one, a series of tombs in northwest Afghanistan at Tilia Tepe, where simply breathtaking and extraordinary hordes of gold and silver were found. All these objects simply seething, I can only say, with artistic influences from both East and West, from Greece, from Rome, from the Middle East, from Persia, from India, from China. And I think this mingling of cultures in Afghanistan in ancient times is best demonstrated simply if I show you a series of images from this exhibition and highlight some of the extraordinary range of artistic influences found, some from very early times. And if nothing else, I think these demonstrate persuasively that travel, interaction, and mutual influences are, in fact, age old. So here is a very ancient bowl found in northern Afghanistan and apparently made locally. And here I want to draw attention to, on, uh, on the right-hand side, the image of a bull, known to be more commonly an image from um, Mesopotamia. Um, some Middle Eastern religions, such as Mithraism, involving a sacred bull. So, in other words, this is a, an artistic motif that comes from modern Iraq, almost 1,200 away, miles away over mountains and deserts. This, which is one of my favorites, um, is a ceremonial plaque or plate depicting Sibylle, the Greek goddess of nature. It dates from the early 3rd century BCE, and it's from Iconum, Alexandra's city. And on this gilded silver plate, the Greek goddess of nature, Sibylle, is riding through her mountain domain in a chariot drawn by two lions, a motif well known from the Greek Mediterranean and from Asia Minor. And the winged goddess Nike, better known to us for the sports goods, is here shown as a charioteer embodying the Greek symbol of victory. And the sun is shown in the guise of the bust of the god Helios, and so far, so Greek, you might say. But there are also, um, I, can't, I don't have a pointer, and I can't show you this, but there are two, you see it behind the chariot, for example, is one of them, two priests with bare feet, which was a symbol in Asia of ritual purity. One of them's carrying a parasol, which is a royal symbol in Eastern art. There's the chariot with its large wheels and its high balustrade, which most resembles Persian ones, and the altar with its high steps over on the right, which is comparable to Syrian and Iranian types. So this is a sort of embodiment of the multicultural influence found at Ai Khanum. And here, this is just a, a small example of Greek architectural features mingling with Persian and other designs made with local materials but adapted to make this kind of architecture of which this city of Alexander is full. This portrait, probably of this gymnasiarch, so-called Strato, from, this second, from the second century BCE, also from Iconum, was found on top, as you can kind of see from this image, of a rectangular pillar, a style which is very common in Greek sculpture. And Iconum, like any other ancient Greek city, had both a theater where, interestingly enough, the arrangement of seats, unlike in Greece, included a place that important visitors could sit, whereas in democratic Greece, um, everybody just got to sit in the front row. Um, but it also had a gymnasium for the physical and intellectual training of its youth, and Strato was probably its director. Well, that's Iconum. The city of Begram sits at the confluence of the Silk Road trade routes, which continued on to Kabul in the south and um, toward the Khyber Pass, 
connecting Afghanistan to Pakistan. And it may, this also may have been a, a, an Alexandrian city. It may have been the Alexandria ad Caucasum, founded by Alexander himself in the 4th century BCE. But in its new royal city, excavated in the 1930s, were found Roman glass. And this glass goblet is really as fantastic as it looked. I saw it as it looks. I saw it at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, at Begram, Roman glass, Chinese lacquerware, Indian style objects carved in ivory and bone were all found, mostly de dating from about this period. So it's a trading center where people settled and where objects from all those distant places seem to have been traded and left behind. So the, I'm just going to show you a few examples. This is a Roman painted glass goblet depicting a scene of date harvesting with two women and two men who seem to be in attendance from Begram, probably made in workshops in Roman Alexandria. This statuette of Harpocrates, modeled in a Greek style, is the Hellenized form of the Egyptian god Horus, son of Isis and Osiris, and it's part of a group of items of, made of bronze and glass, thought to show evidence of a maritime trade from the Roman Mediterranean, again, probably from Alexandria. And now, just to look sort of in the opposite direction, here is um, an ivory figure, one of several that were found, showing a young and rather voluptuous woman on the back of a makara, a creature from Indian mythology that has the tail of a fish and the body and face of a crocodile. Not, someone you, not a creature you would want to meet, I think. Um, this is an ivory plaque with women standing under Indian-style gateways. And again, the voluptuous bodies, the diaphanous clothing, and the lush jewelry are reminiscent of Indian representations, which focus on the beauty and fertility of young women. And then Chinese. This is actually from Tilia Tepe, not Begram, to the northwest. And these are a pair of shoe buckles depicting a chariot, I hope you can see on this image, drawn by dragons. The turquoises were local in Afghanistan, but the bamboo-like uprights, if you can make those out, supporting the canopy. And the dragons themselves very much bring Chinese imagery to mind. In addition to which, the two light-wheeled chariots are just the kind that are known from tombs of the Chinese Han Empire. So that brings me to China, um, which is what I usually teach about when I'm teaching. But it, my Silk Roads classes always include China in one form or another. For some people, China is the sine qua non of the Silk Roads. Um, because the capital at Chang'an, which is more or less modern Xi'an, the home of the famous terracotta army, um, that was the, often referred to as the eastern terminus of the Silk Road. And it had links to other parts of the world from very early on. I just have to find my other, going back to the map. There we are. I've taught courses on China and the Silk Roads at NYU now for almost a decade, and it's such a vast topic. It's rather overwhelming, and in fact, I've tried it out in various different configurations, both in terms of subject matter and in terms of chronology. And the first time I taught it, I focused primarily on religions, not least to show how many different religions coexisted fairly effectively along the Silk Roads. And the peoples of the Silk Roads in the early decades followed a surprising number of different religions. In the Middle East, many people worshipped the gods and goddesses of the Greco-Roman pantheon. And others were followers of the old religion of Egypt, especially the cult of Isis and Osiris. Jewish merchants and other settlers had spread out and established their own places of worship in towns and cities throughout the region. Some people, as I mentioned earlier, followed Mithraism, a religion originally of Persian origin that became popular in the armies of Rome as well as among the general populace. And central to its theology was a struggle between good and evil, symbolized by the sacrifice of a sacred bull. Remember the bull. And elsewhere in the Middle East, and especially in Persia and Central Asia, many people were adherents of Zoroastrianism, a Persian religion that also posited a struggle between good and evil and between light and darkness. And it used fire as the symbol of the purifying power of good. And that was probably borrowed from the Brahmanic religion of early India. Meanwhile, the Sogdians from near Samarkand, who were traders so dominant on the Silk Roads that their language, which was an Iranian dialect, became its lingua, the lingua franca of the Silk Road. 
They were usually Zoroastrians, as we know, not least from tombs recently excavated in China. A Persian prince, we know, fleeing from the collapsing Sasanian Empire in the 7th century, built a Zoroastrian temple in China, in the Tang capital. But devotees in China were mostly foreign merchants, not Chinese. Christianity also spread eastward along the Silk Roads, especially in its Nestorian version, Nestorianism being a heresy that started in the 5th century. Nestorian Christians erected a monument in China in 781 that was inscribed in Syriac and Chinese. And about a thousand years later, European Jesuits discovered it with huge excitement. Meanwhile, the Greek colonies of Central Asia that had been left behind by, uh, after the collapse of Alexander's empire by the first century BC had largely converted from their Greco-Roman pagan religions to Buddhism, a religion that was soon going to use the Silk Road to spread far and wide. Uh, Buddhism first reached China in the first century, most often by way of Dunhuang, which, let me just go back to my map. Um, if you see the line going from China where the road splits, that's Dunhuang. Um, it's an oasis town in the far west of China. It wasn't always actually under Chinese <coughs> political control. And it was a major crossroads at the eastern end of the Taklamakan Desert, which someone told me Taklamakan means you go in, but you don't come out. Um, that desert, people had to go around it. People might take the northern or southern route. Dunhuang was a place where people either prepared for or recovered from the extreme rigors of desert travel on their east-west or west-east journey. And at first, Buddhism had few converts in China, not least because many of its tenets originating in the profoundly different culture of India were incompatible with traditional beliefs associated with Confucianism concerning the harmonious functioning of the family and society. For, for example, celibacy um, in, was a, a big deal in Buddhism, and it was directly contrary to the Chinese idea of family uh, and the idea that you should continue your family line and have children. Um, and similarly, the idea of um, the this-worldly focus of Confucianism was very contrary to the central ideas in about the cycle of rebirths and the many um, series of existences that people had. But eventually, and in no small measure as a consequence, not only of its spiritual components, but of its social service component, Buddhism became well integrated into Chinese society. And at the same time, it was exported, if you like, or carried on its journey, taking on some Chinese characteristics from China onto Korea and Japan and Vietnam and so on, and adapting new ones in those new homes. And I mentioned this as an indication that even China served as a kind of crossroads. Between the second and seventh centuries also, Buddhist monks famously traveled from China to India to bring back religious texts, sutras, and also um, they, they brought them back to translate them into Chinese. And in fact, it was the Buddhist desire to mass produce texts, both for proselytizing and to gain religious merit, that gave rise to the earliest printed books in the world the Diamond Sutra, first printed in the 10th century. It was also at Dunhuang in the early 20th century that a fabulous cache of documents was discovered in a cave that had been walled up for 900 years. This is a well-known story, but it, it continues to be so extraordinary that it bears repeating, I think. When a, the Hungarian-British explorer, Oral Stein, very familiar with the Buddhist pilgrims who had gone to India to fetch classical texts, Buddhist texts, so long before, persuaded, really on the basis of his knowledge of those travelers, he persuaded the keeper of the treasure trove in Dunhuang to open it up. The first documents that he brought out were, in fact, none other than some of those scriptures that that Chinese monk had brought back from India and translated into Chinese in the seventh century. And that's an epic journey that every Chinese child learns about. Uh, it's the, the, the subject of a, a novel called The Journey to the West, sometimes in English called Monkey. Every Chinese child knows the story of the Monkey King. And those documents that were the first to come out of the cave were followed by more that were Buddhist, that were Taoist, Confucian, Zoroastrian, Nestorian, Christian. They showed links to Persia, 
to Tukaria in modern Afghanistan, to Sogdiana, Samarkand, now in uh, modern Uzbekistan, as well as to China, and still other texts that, of course, had no um, connection to religion at all. And some of them were in languages that had never been encountered by Western scholars before or any other scholars. And Stein purchased vast quantities of these documents, which are now in the British Museum, while other scholar explorers who followed him took more to Paris and some to Berlin, where they then were destroyed by Allied bombing in World War II. These riches were readily sold by the Chinese priests in charge, but the question remains whether they should be returned to China, where they were found, though many of them are not Chinese, or whether they should be kept in the Western museums where they've spent the last century under preservation through war and revolution and ch possible destruction in China, for example, in the Cultural Revolution in the 1970s. And eloquent claims have recently been made for the idea that art belongs to everyone. It's a question that students hotly debate every time it comes up, often after a museum visit in New York. And I never know from year to year on which side of this debate about cosmopolitanism and the ownership of art a consensus will emerge. And it's often different from year to year, which is interesting in itself. That was Buddhism, but now on to Islam, which came to dominate much of the Silk Road soon after its genesis, both because of its spiritual power and because Muslim traders preferred to deal with others, other Muslim traders. And Silk Road fades from the Middle East to the northwestern reaches of China were challenged and soon were largely displaced by Islam. In the seventh century, Islam arrived in China. Um, the first one in 627, a few years before the death of the prophet. And it was largely responsible for the decline of Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism and Central Asian Buddhism and the other local religions of the Silk Road. And henceforth, travelers on the Silk Roads might belong still to any of those religions, but the lands through which they passed, everywhere west of the borders of China, were with very few exceptions part of the world of Islam. So the Silk Road and religion was one version of this course in the past. But later, I concluded that it would be more meaningful to students to give them some sense of what part of the modern world corresponded to the lands traversed by the old trade routes. And as it happens, I first taught that version, um, or, uh, this new version of the Silk Roads, which I call the Silk Roads from antiquity down to the present. In the fall of 2001, at the very time of the World Trade Center attacks, when maps of what had been the Silk Roads were on the front of the newspapers day after day, so much so that even students who sort of blundered through their semesters without paying a lot of attention to what's going on around them realized that there was a link between what they were learning in the classroom and what they were hearing all about them and reading in the newspaper and seeing on television. And in this version of the Silk Roads course, I often start in the 19th century with the great game, the contest between Britain, France, and Russia in Central Asia in the 19th century, and then shift attention back to antiquity. And I often think that people talk about the great game today very much in the same way that they talk about the Silk Road. It's a, it's a metaphor for all kinds of things, not necessarily referring back very specifically to what it once was. I've also tried incorporating the 20th century into Silk Road's classes, but I found that it requires an undue attention to Soviet history, to Afghanistan as a theater of war, and to ethnic issues in Xinjiang. So I usually stop more or less in the 19th century. But as I began to think about the ways in which an Abu Dhabi perspective might change a course on the Silk Roads, I was still thinking about Tang China, which had considerable links with this part of the world. Uh, for example, Tang coins have been found in Egypt. Um, and the Tang was a highly cosmopolitan period in China when countless foreign traders could be found in the capital and other major cities, as well as in ports along the southeast coast. And the taste for all sorts of foreign luxuries and wonders began to spread from the court to city dwellers more generally. The Tang capital Chang'an, which I mentioned before, was the largest and most sophisticated city in the world with a taxable population of about two million people. And it had an extraordinarily multicultural population. In addition to Turks from Central Asia, Uyghurs from China's northwest frontiers, Sogdians from Samarkands, Jews, Arabs, Persians, Indians, both Hindu and Buddhist, there were also Koreans, Tibetans, Malays, Japanese, Javanese, Khmers, Sinhalese, and Tamils, and so on. 
and many of them, along with the two humped Bactrian camels that plied the trade along the Silk Roads, became the stock figures of Tang figurines. For example, here you have a ta uh, Tang camel with three foreign riders who have big curly beards, Central Asian top knots, and especially large noses, suggesting a Western Asian origin. And in fact, the Chinese word for barbarian is related to the word for beard. Here's another similar picture, a camel with a foreign rider. And here we have a curly-headed youth, all of these from the early 8th century, tomb figures, suggesting, I think, a fascination with things foreign. And also, these note the clothes, which are not really very Chinese at all. Cultural life in Tang China, in fact, was awash with in foreign imports, including the Persian game of polo played on horseback by men and women alike, first in China and later in Korea and Japan. Foreign dance styles, often highly erotic, accompanied by unfamiliar melodies with strange um, musical notations. And here are two musicians. Uh, you can differentiate these women both through their dress and their hairstyles. The figure on the right is from Western Xinjiang, a Kuchean. She's playing a pipa lute. And that's an instrument that originated in Iran and reached China via the Silk Road, becoming popular in the 5th century. The Chinese woman on the left plays a jiegu, which is a, a drum originating in India, made from skin stretched over a wooden frame. And many melodies were played using these two instruments. So we've learned that entertainments generally move back and forth along the Silk Roads. And here is an itinerant uh, storyteller from Dunhuang. We think that's what it is. Um, he could either be a monk with a backpack full of scrolls and a staff and a t tiger, or it's also been suggested that he's a traveling storyteller and that his, scr um, his scrolls are illustration for public performances of his stories. And the storyteller, which I think is probably what he is, would have traveled from town to town um, performing popular Buddhist tales. And so f in that way, folk culture would spread along the Silk Road by these kinds of traveling performers. And that brings me to the next point, one that's very often brought up by students, namely, how on earth did the different people along the Silk Roads communicate with one another? And I mentioned that the Iranian dialect of Sogdian was the lingua franca, but often people who encountered one another didn't have a language in common. And some of the ways that they found in these very early days to deal with this problem were surprisingly modern. And this is a phrase book from Dunhuang from the 10th century, and it contains useful sentences such as, where are you going? Do you know Chinese? Bring me some vegetables. And the Chinese words are written in a sort of a Brahmi script. I don't know, this is not a very clear image. Um, so a Khotanese person, Khotan being in the very far west of Xinjiang, uh, would have an idea of how to pronounce the sounds of Chinese. And then there's a translation after that in Khotanese. And the format's very similar to modern phrase books with phonetic approximations of the foreign language followed by a translation into the language of the speaker learning it. And that brings me to the last point that I want to make, and it's one about assimilation and the supposed purity of separateness and separateness of cultures. In China in particular, there's long been an idea that Chinese culture functioned as a kind of, well, it's two different metaphors, but as a magnet or a sponge to which others were inevitably first attracted, using the magnet metaphor, and then absorbed, using the sponge metaphor. And in fact, the idea has been that its charms were so irresistible that all those other others who had been drawn towards it would eventually willingly set aside their own cultures and assimilate completely into Chinese culture. That was the idea behind giving the Xiongnu nomads goods that they would be so seduced by Chinese luxuries that they would give up their warlike ways and simply become Chinese, as it were. And of course, in a sense, there was a fatal weakness in that argument, because taken to its logical conclusion, it suggested that most, if not all, Chinese had started out or were descended from others who had previously undergone this process of acculturation. And it suggests also, I think, that there was some kind of pure Chinese 
culture unadulterated by input from any other kind of culture. And we may laugh in scorn, but I think this idea is by no means unique to China. So as people came into contact with one another, intermarrying and borrowing ideas and mixing cultures, and as people of different religions, religious faiths intermingled and lived side by side, as silk became the luxury fabric of Western monarchs, and as designs and ideas and pigments, and I'm thinking here of cobalt, which is the essential ingredient of Chinese blue and white porcelain, but which actually started life, as it were, in Persia. As all those were imported, of course, they had an effect on cultures and lives and so on. The idea of nations is really a very modern one. And its exclusionary ethos is introduced, is, I'm sorry, is contradicted, I think, by the whole experience of the Silk Road. So we can take away the idea that reading back from the present to the past and assuming no change is highly misleading. And that not only outposts, the diasporic settlements along the Silk Road, are changed by the advent of outsiders, but change also occurs back home as well. And that much of these exchanges, were made, um, though they were made possible by the actions of states, actually took place at a much more basic and individual level. And that they had an incremental effect and finally, perhaps, we can embrace the notion that both as idea and as reality, the manifold exchanges of the Silk Roads can serve as a template in the present and for the future as we create a new global network of ideas and peoples. Thank you very much. Can you comment on whether government or rulers of various territories along the Silk Road, whether they, their attitude towards this trade, whether they promote actively or hinder this, this trade? I don't think it's something that you can make, give a categorical answer to because it, would, it depends on so many factors. Some governments supported links and some didn't. Um, on the whole, I think that Governments tended to support trade or to, 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 to promote trade to the extent that it was useful to them. But if they thought it was disruptive to them, then they didn't support it. But on the whole, it brought them good revenue. So they did. But, but, but it's, very, it, it, it's a question about which it's almost impossible to, having just made a generalization, it's almost impossible to give a, a general answer. Because you'd have to be specific, I think. Would you comment about the influence the Silk Route, the Silk Route had on the the evolution of local um, um, handy crafts such as the you mentioned cobalt blue being used in the Iranian? Uh, did it also affect and uh, inspire Iznik um, ceramics? Did it inspire the the copy of Ming? Uh, type uh, ceramics in Iran that was then in turn sold on as Chinese but made in Iran to to the West. Could you please comment on the influence, if at all possible? This is a question about, um, really about ceramics and other handicrafts and the way in which the ingredients for blue and white went from Iran to China and then the blue and white ceramics were exported to back to Iran and that some ceramics were then made there and also Iznik ware in Turkey that in, in some respects imitated the Chinese ceramics and in some respects were or some some instances were passed off as Chinese and this is an absolutely wonderful example of how the Silk Road worked um, <coughs> That's exactly what it was all about, really. Th that people took ideas and designs and practices and made them their own. And we know, for example, that there was a... Th there, actually, very recently, there was an exhibition in London at the British Museum relating to Shah Jahan of Persia, in which many people thought the most interesting thing were the blue and white Chinese ceramics from the Ardeville Shrine. 
And we also know that the, the Topkapi in Istanbul has a fa fabulous collection of Chinese ceramics. But some of the designs on those ceramics were not what you might call traditionally Chinese. They incorporated Islamic motifs and the shapes of the, I, I hesitate speaking to art historians, um, they incorporated the shapes that were more common in, I, I think it's sort of odd to talk about Islamic ceramics, but people do, those kinds of shapes. So you had a, a wonderful and very rich mingling of, of designs, of techniques, of shapes, and so on. There's also a very interesting thing, and that, I should perhaps say that I, I, before I became a historian, I was going to be, be a, an art historian until a young man I was interested in said, why don't you become an art historian? It's such a good job for a woman. And I was so enraged that I ab <laughs> abandoned, <laughs> abandoned that and became a historian instead. But I'm a sort of art historian manqué, I guess. Um, but a lot of silver design from Iran went to China and was then remade in ceramics. That's one thing. But a lot of ceramics that came west was mounted in silver. For example, you have from the early 17th century Chinese ceramics mounted in, in silver in London. And you also have some of those which have showed up in Virginia, in the United States, um, from a very early settlement time. So that's a wonderful example of how the Silk Road worked. So I wonder if you could comment or elaborate a bit on the sea uh, seafaring traders who came by Dao from ancient Dilmun to Megan, this area, including Oman, and reached China. Because I read some years ago that uh, the Omanis were tracing this journey and that they found evidence of a Dao from Oman in China. And I wonder if you could just talk a bit about that sea route part of the Silk Road. I don't know about that specific example, um, though I don't doubt that it's true. We know that certainly by the third century, there were Arabs living in uh, Guangzhou, in Canton, on the southeast coast of China. And recently, a shipwreck was found off the coast of Indonesia, which contains Chinese stuff from about the ninth century. And in fact, somebody is coming next week to talk to my Silk Roads class in New York about that shipwreck. So this was something that certainly began from very early on. Um, the, um, the sea routes, I think, were very busy um, and were, were uh, some people think that Buddhism, which was traditionally thought to have gone from India to China overland, actually went by sea. So there is. This is a, an area of study which is, I think, not all that well studied yet, or well documented, well known about. But there are so many isolated incidents that suddenly people have said, oh, let's put, let's put all this together. On this topic of exchanging items, rather than um, having the link of the styles of, of, of the art, um, when items were exchanged, where they um, obviously very much of it must have been barter, things just changed hands, objects changed hands. But also, there must be a very interesting um, <coughs> study to be made of how currencies and the idea of currencies um, sort of having a common currency, certainly for certain regions and where these regions would expand as the trade was expanding and interest in the objects was expanding. And on the other hand, obviously, some currencies would never have made it to the other end. So it continued also to be a matter of uh, barter. And maybe you could shed some light on the real relationship between bartering and trading with currencies and what kind of currencies could one be thinking of. This is a, also an area which people have begun to study in great detail and about which I have to admit I don't know a great deal. But I must say that one of the images I didn't show you today because I thought I had too many pictures um, is a coin which was Chinese in, in form with a, hole, a square hole in the middle. 
and Chinese characters on one side, and on the other side, it had, I think, Cotanese writing or something like that. So coins were used kind of fungibly, in a sense, in that way. So they, they themselves could be traded on in a, in, a, in a relay way. I mentioned also that Tang coins had been found, I think, certainly in Egypt, and also, I think, on the east coast of Africa. Um, I do think, though, that barter was a very large part of what went on and that people, that, that was part of the relay system, in a sense, that, that barter took place. In, in specific terms, I can't really say very much more than that. But it is, so many of these things are areas for study that many people spend their whole lives on just one or two of these fascinating topics. Um, I wondered what he thought about the idea of using the, the Silk Route still in a modern way as a kind of uh, political way of breaking down barriers and binding this area. Um, I was not so long ago, I was in Gansu province in uh, Lanzhou and traveling around and many people in this part of the world don't realize about the high percentage of Muslims that there are in that, that, that area and the beautiful mosques that are in, in that area. I took many photographs of the mosques there. Recently we've had of course bad news for this area, the neighboring Xinjiang province and the rioting and of course there are many, much of the situation is to do with the modern political situation in China with Han Chinese coming in, build, doing large building projects and the uh, Muslim sort of minority in that area being kind of marginalized, but in, in many cases they're not a mon minority, they're a majority. Um, I wonder if tourism and, the, and, and, and kind of promoting the Silk Road in a modern way can help to pr bring sort of understanding and more peace to this area, because one of the things that was astonishing, I was on an official trip there hosted by the Chinese government and they wouldn't they cancelled one part of our tour, which was quite interesting, which was to a Buddhist monastery, but they encouraged us to visit the um, uh, mosques there because they thought we're coming from the Gulf. We have to show them mosques, but because of, of course, because of Buddhism and Dalai Lama and Mongolia and other issues, uh, they were very sensitive on that. And I wonder if, if really uh, the, the Silk Route provides a way of joining and providing understanding between these countries, and it still is a useful concept to use. Many tour companies, of course, promise a Silk Road route. Um, what is your, just to get to the question, what is your take um, on the, the modern political situation in China, that area of the Silk Road? Because it's a fascinating and beautiful area, that area, and it's quite a difficult area for outsiders to, to go to. But I think if more people went to northwest China, to Xinjiang, to Gansu province, they would have a deeper understanding of the Silk Road and also of, of the real China as well. This, uh, so what is your sort of take on these modern developments and can we use the Silk Road to promote? I think we can use the Silk Road to promote greater understanding, but I'm not sure it's going to happen. I think actually you, you very perceptively connected the Chinese idea, idea about the, the Buddhism and the Dalai Lama and so on, and Chinese ideas about Islam. And my own theory is this, and it's entirely drawn from my home base in the 18th century, as it were, is that Chinese governments then and now are extremely wary of religious beliefs that have a focus outside of China. So they're wary of Buddhism because of the Dalai Lama, based, um, as it were, in Tibet. And they're wary of Islam. And I believe it's true that there are Muslims in every province of China, a lot of Muslims in every province of China, um, and which is not something that people think about. People don't think about Chinese Muslims, but there are very many of them. And I think the Chinese are rather scared of them, to tell you the truth. And Christianity, because, especially Catholicism, because of the Pope. Um, again, it's a sort of, in the, in the 17th and 18th century, there was, the, there was a, a, in the case of Christianity and in the case of Tibetan Buddhism, and really later in the case of Islam, there were um, attempts on the part of the church in Rome to, and the Dalai Lama in um, Lhasa, to get their adherents in China to declare their allegiance, as it were, to them and the emperor of China at that time 
was extremely loath to allow his subjects to have a, a split loyalty. And I think, I, I regret to say, but I think more than the drawing to get the, the sort of drawing together idea of the Silk Road, that is a contrary or contradictory force which may have more power for the time being at any rate. People in, in Xinjiang, where the riots this past summer were between Uyghurs and Han Chinese, it's a, a very culturally geared to Turkey and Muslim countries of, of Central Asia. And they're not at all geared to China and not at all friendly to Chinese. And that was true when I was traveling there 25 years ago. So I don't feel very optimistic about it. I'd like to say yes, but I'm not very <laughs> optimistic about it. The caravans traveling, transversing the Silk Route, uh, were there many women on that? Would there be children on that? What would have been I the... I think the short answer is no. <laughs> no women? In the sense that I think this was really, the Silk Roads were traversed by men and not by women, for the most part. Not to say that women never traveled, but for the most part, they didn't. They stayed home, they raised families, they farmed the land, or they took, off, look, took care of animals. I mean, it was different in a sort of nomadic setup, but from a, a Chinese point of view, I think women were left for long periods of time alone. Or, uh, they, I mean, alone, they, were, they would be part of a larger family, but they would not be uh, part of that traveling relay at all. And I think also that some of the uh, merchants who settled far from home ended up marrying local women. So, you know, I mean, they weren't married in the first place, and they married local women. So I think that this is a, it's another of those understudied topics, but I think it's that basically that was the situation. And you, you, you had that in China to a certain extent be, among official families where the, um, the official would be posted to a different part of the country, and he might take his family with, with him, but he might not. In, in which case women would be left basically to hold the fort and support the family. And if, they, if, if, some, if money was sent to them, that was nice. But if it wasn't, they had to figure out what to do and how to sort of maintain the dignity of the family in the face of sometimes great poverty, despite gentility, as it were, and all those kinds of things. So just a question about earlier periods. Did the Romans have anything that the Chinese wanted? Or put another way, did classical civilization have anything that the East wanted to trade back? Yes, they had um, glass, they had coral. I think those were the main things that they had. And I think they had gold as well. Not that there wasn't gold in some parts of, especially Xinjiang actually, but those were the main things that, that, that were wanted by China from Rome. 